My name is Jacelyn Peabody Lever. I'm a fifth year MD PhD student at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. My PhD mentor is physician scientist pulmonologist, AAP and ASCI member, Dr. Stephen Rowe. The title of my talk is Mucus Matters, Blue Mycin Induced Pulmonary Fibrosis in Ferrets is Sustained and Recapitulates Features of Human Idiopathic Pulmonary Fibrosis. IPF is a devastating fatal lung disease of older adults. The median survival is only three to five years from the time of diagnosis, which represents worse prognosis than even lung cancer, and there are no curative therapies. Below, we can see a progression of IPF by CT. This is when the patient first presented. Here we see that the lung is uh, very black uh, and architecture is fairly normal. Uh, but here we see this subpleural honeycomb change in early interstitial lung abnormalities. And as this patient's disease course uh, progresses, you can see that more of those black, uh, what was once healthy functional alveolar capillary units, uh, are being destroyed and getting this white uh, opacification representing fibrotic change. And this patient actually died uh, 36 months after being diagnosed. We don't know the cause of IPF, but we do know there are several genetic risk factors. Uh, the MUC5B gain-of-function promoter variant uh, is the most significant genetic risk for developing IPF. Ten separate GWAS studies have confirmed this. You can see uh, MUC5B on the Manhattan plot here, and uh, MUC5B in relation to the other genetic risk factors, uh, high effect size and uh, common allele. So people with the MUC5B variant have 34.1-fold increased MUC5B mucin expression. IPF patients who have the risk-inferring variant uh, make the most mucin of all, having 5.3-fold increased MUC5B expression relative to IPF. And what I want you to note here is IPF as a group has increased MUC5B expression compared to these wild-type healthy controls, but IPF patients that have the risk-conferring variant have the most mucin of all. So IPF patients make more MUC5B mucus, but they also make MUC4, more MUC5B mucus in aberrant locations in the lung. Here we have IHC uh, from an IPF patient demonstrating MUC5B in bronchoalveolar epithelia, as well as these uh, MUC5B honeycomb cysts, which are mucociliary uh, in nature and should not be found um, in the lung. And as you can see, this uh, is an area where normally gas exchange should be occurring, uh, but that's filled with fibrosis as well as uh, this MUC5B. Which brings us to the question, does mucus matter in IPF? When these studies first came out, it was a very surprising finding. We think about uh, lung diseases as being two flavors. We have the interstitial lung diseases like IPF, and we have airway diseases, uh, which tend to be problems with mucus, like cystic fibrosis and COPD. MUC5B is the major gel-forming mucin in the conducting airways. IPF is not a conducting airway disease, so what is having too much MUC5B mucus, and how is that conferring risk in IPF or driving the progression of fibrosis in these patients? Does mucus matter in IPF? And the interplay between mucociliary dysregulation and the development of pulmonary fibrosis is a major gap in knowledge. My hypothesis is that excessive MUC5B production in response to injury results in abnormal activation of progenitor basal-like cells, resulting in aberrant repair mechanism and proximalization of the distal lung. So to investigate this hypothesis and to try to get after what is mucus or MUC5B doing in the context of pulmonary fibrosis, uh, we have moved to generate a novel ferret model. Now, ferrets are better than rodents for testing this hypothesis because they actually have more similar anatomy and physiology to humans. They actually have submucosal glands throughout their lungs, which submucosal glands are the major source of MUC5B in humans. Uh, the MUC5B uh, expression and distribution is much more similar to humans. Mice only express uh, submucosal glands in MUC5B in the proximal three tracheal rings, uh, whereas ferrets, wild-type ferrets, have MUC5B in the same distributions as humans. And there's also the basal cell distribution is much more similar in ferrets compared to uh, rodents. 
Now, ferrets are an established model in other lung diseases. They're kind of the Goldilocks model uh, from John Engelhardt's group. There's this, of course, the cystic fibrosis ferret. And our group uh, came up with the first animal model of chronic bronchitis in a smoke-exposed uh, ferret model. So we thought that maybe we would be able to leverage uh, the ferret similarity to model pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, to drive a point home, ferrets are not rodents, uh, they are mustelids. So my first specific aim is to determine the impact of mucin and microenvironments on mucociliary physiology and repair mechanisms in a blue mycin-induced pulmonary fibrosis ferret. Uh, and for the bulk of this talk, just because of time, um, I'll just be showing you our model development in our normal wild-type ferret. Uh, but where this project is going and get excited for our hopefully in-person meeting next year, uh, we are doing these experiments uh, in the context of mucus overproduction as well as mucus underproduction with both pharmacologic and genetic models of those. But to start things off, we just have to give wild-type ferrets uh, bleomycin. And bleomycin is a chemotherapeutic agent that has been classically used to cause fibrosis in other animal models and we just uh, microsprayed five units per kilogram ferrets and uh, tracked their progression over time. This uh, top here is showing you what a control ferret CT looks like uh, compared to a day zero bleomycin exposed ferret. Here's what their lungs look like at three weeks. You start to see opacification here and some airway centric uh, fibrotic change. And at 12 weeks, you can see that the lung is pretty scarred down and there's uh, severe fibrotic change. And this is a representative fibrosis uh, progression by micro CT uh, for one male ferret and a age sex matched uh, control ferret here. What we do is we uh, look at the 85th percentile of the lung mask represented here. So very, very black areas are filled with air and considered healthy and normal. And as uh, and air has a value of minus 1,000 Hounsfield units. Bone has a value of positive 1,000 Hounsfield units. So this is showing you very black to very white as uh, lungs become fibrosed, uh, they become more white over time. So this is the quantification of the 85th percentile of um, this time course here, showing you that at day zero and control, um, those histograms line up, and these dotted lines are the 85th percentile, and we can see that rightward shift indicating uh, opacification of the lungs um, over time by micro CT. And this is our cross sectional data here uh, looking at the Hounsfield units, uh, weeks plus bleomycin. So at uh, three weeks and 12 weeks, we have significant um, opacification and an increase in P85, um, but no significant difference between weeks three and 12. We also do functional studies on these ferrets. Uh, so following bleomycin exposure, um, this is our flex event setup, which is essentially a way for us to do pulmonary function tests in these animals. So I intubate the ferret with a cuffed tracheal tube. It's a closed system. The airway is occluded. And then we can measure things uh, like pressure volume loops. So this is average data from um, female ferrets. Uh, ferrets are sexually dimorphic, so I'm only just showing one sex, and I'll get to the sex standardized uh, in a minute. Um, but what we can see here is this is what the um, day zero pressure volume loop looks like, and we start to see hallmarks of restrictive change where we have that downward shift at three weeks and 12 weeks uh, post bleomycin exposure. And we can measure inspiratory capacity using this same uh, technique. So here's the raw values in milliliters where we start to see here we get a significant decrement of inspiratory capacity um, at three weeks that is not resolving by 12 weeks following a single installation of bleomycin. And when we sex standardize and include uh, the male data as well, we see uh, no change in inspiratory capacity in the control group, but we have a significant decrease um, at three weeks that is sustained through 12 weeks. And we also measure the uh, oxygen saturation, and we don't have any difference between our control animals and our day zero animals. They're all uh, satting around 100%, but we do see uh, 
a significant decrease in oxygen saturation both at three weeks and 12 weeks, indicating that they are not saturating their body as well, and we do have reduced lung function in the context of bleomycin exposure. Now, bleomycin exposure uh, induces fibrosis and collagen deposition. Uh, what we can see here, this is a histologic pictograph of a bleomycin ferret at 12 weeks uh, and a control ferret here. So in this zoom in, you can see this fibrotic uh, retraction and fibrosis centered around the airways as well as distal. You see the pleural being pulled in by that fibrotic change. Uh, and then here in this zoom in, we have these uh, fibroblastic foci and we have these ciliated uh, spaces here representing mucociliary honeycomb cysts. So all of these asterisks are areas that are aberrantly ciliated and uh, FF is indicative of fibroblastic foci, areas that we think um, are the leading edge of fibrosis and have this gnarled um, fibrotic appearance. So the gold standard for measuring um, collagen deposition in our field is hydroxyproline. The third amino acid in collagen is hydroxyproline. So this is a biochemical reading of uh, collagen deposition. And what we see here is we get an increase in hydroxyproline levels at three weeks uh, and at 12 weeks, but no significant difference between three weeks and 12 weeks. And here I'm showing you gross um, photos of what uh, age and sex matched um, ferrets look like. So here's what a control ferret looks like. This is at three weeks post uh, bleomycin exposure. You start to see this fibrotic lobulation, uh, which you can see here as well. But this is what that looks like grossly. And that persists through um, 12 weeks where you can see this. It's not quite uh, cobblestoning. It's more lobulation at this point. Um, but that is a precursor to the cobblestone change that we see in IPF patients. Uh, so this was very exciting for us that we can give bleomycin to a ferret and they get sustained um, fibrosis and collagen deposition, both histologically and by micro CT, uh, biochemically as well. So three of the hallmarks of human IPF are MUC5B rich honeycomb cysts, fibroblastic foci, and proximalization of these distal airway spaces. Um, so here's control ferret versus bleomycin ferret. Uh, with MUC5B immunohistochemistry, we see that we also get these cystic spaces that are filled with MUC5B. Here in the distal lung, we start to see uh, fibroblastic foci. And in these uh, very distal spaces uh, at the bronchoalveolar duct junction, we're now uh, getting MUC5B expression where it should not be. And acetylated tubulin is a marker for cilia. So not only are these spaces producing mucin, but they're also ciliated. And here we can see, this is bronchoalveolar duct junction. These are alveoli here. This should all be alveoli and there should not be these proximal airway markers, uh, this distal in the lung. And this is very similar to what we see in human IPF. Mucociliary uh, MUC5B rich honeycomb cysts, fibroblastic foci, as well as uh, MUC5B and ciliated bronchialized distal spaces. This was very exciting uh, for us to see that the ferret pathology recapitulates key features of human IPF. And our next question uh, relates directly to what is happening in these proximalized distal airway spaces? What is happening with the epithelium and what is happening with basal cells? Uh, so we have two plans of attack to address that. It's to actually do laser capture micro dissection on um, airways, which this is a small airway that's in a very fibrotic uh, area. So we'll be able to bend these airways based on size and fibrosis severity. The other uh, technique that we're doing is actually um, dissecting out the airways, doing a single cell suspension and sequencing uh, those cells from an airway enriched sample. And uh, on the left here, you can see a video of me doing uh, that dissection. 
So here I'm ripping away the parenchyma and separating the vessels from the airway tree. And here we can see, oh, I should just stop right at the end here. So here we can see uh, the dissected airways and the pulmonary uh, vasculature here that I was able to dissect away from one uh, lobe of a ferret. So that's going to be our approach to actually be able to understand what is happening um, at an airway specific level. The benefit of the uh, laser capture micro dissection is that it gives us spatial information about not only uh, airway size but also neighborhood. Was it in a uh, very fibrotic area or was it in a preserved area? Because we think that microenvironment um, certainly matters in this context. So uh, with that, I'd like to um, acknowledge my lab and our collaborators, uh, my thesis committee, and of course my funding sources. Um, thank you so much uh, everybody for listening today. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me, email my boss, tweet at me, um, use Mucus Matters. And uh, I wanna give a special thank you to the APSA meeting organizers for making the APSA virtual meeting possible. Um, it's absolutely incredible that you've been able to make something that was a real bummer with the coronavirus pandemic having to cancel our meeting, but us still being able to share science um, and discuss with each other. So thank you for all of your work to make this virtual meeting possible. And thanks for listening.